Well, I have in mind a certain person to interview tonight that I've known almost since uh, I began my research in Wild West history. And this person, he or she, uh, has made a great contribution to the study of Wild West history, uh, its characters, its events. And uh, to narrow it down a little bit, this person has been vitally interested in things that took place in Tombstone and Cochise County and Arizona. And are we getting warm yet? Peter Brand, tonight is your night. Come on down. Or do we need to clean up on aisle seven? <laughs> we don't get you over here every year, so I'm picking on you. I'm in total shock. Total shock. Well, I was in total shock yesterday, so welcome to the club. Uh, people, people are going to want to listen? Well, we'll find out. If they start walking out, we'll cut this short. I don't think that's going to happen. Peter is, uh, as most of you know, probably our most knowledgeable and deeply aware historian of the, what we call the Vendetta Posse. Though that's certainly not a uh, limit on the areas in which he works. And uh, I've had a little bit of help in uh, putting together some information. And some of it you may be glad to hear and some of it you may say, well, let's move on. That doesn't sound good. I'm going to be nice. <laughs> Thanks. If it's rare, I know, I know. Peter was born, obviously. You're not going to give a date. November 27th, 19 or something. Whatever, yeah. Yeah. In Sydney, Australia. To Terry and Margaret Brand. Went to high school at Holy Cross High School in Gladesville, Sydney. Attended Macquarie University, studying accounting. And one of my sources, Peter, said besides accounting, he enjoyed music and nightlife. M more so than the university is. <laughs> we got the university right, huh? Well, I want to just ask you a few things about uh, life in Australia. I know that you work for major techs. Tell us a little bit about your life working for major techs. Well, I'm not sure anybody's going to be interested in that, really. Sure, yeah. Really? Just tell us a little bit about how you got into that field. So I went to Macquarie University and studied economics and accounting and realized very early on that I loved accounting, but I did not like economics. I was introduced to music and um, other social activities at the university, and uh, I, I enjoyed it immensely. Um, and that led to a job with uh, a major telecommunications company in Australia. Fortunately, it was the, the big, uh, company, so I was able to uh, join that company and do basic accounting, um, account inquiries and things like that. Uh, and the, the company was so large that I was able to do various jobs in various departments without leaving the company. I was able to move around within that same company and therefore build up benefits over time. Uh, I was a long-term employee. Um, in fact, what I see here is that you worked for Major Tex, which became Telecom, which became Telestra. Correct, yes. For 40 years. 40 years, yes. One company. That's pretty rare, folks. Well, it, well, it was my first and only job. Oh. First and only job. Uh, 
one sister, uh, Julie. And that, I always like to add that um, that one sister is actually a sister. Yes. So she's a Roman Catholic nun. Um, and she's been a Roman Catholic nun her entire adult life. So she graduated as a school teacher and then um, joined as a, the novitiate at the age of 21. And uh, she's, she rose to the highest rank of the order, went to Rome, um, and then, like, she's far more accomplished than I am, but, uh, yeah, she went to Rome, went to all through the South Pacific, and uh, I'm proud to say that she's a, uh, an extremely talented and uh, giving person. Well, you came from good stock. I just wonder, where did you go wrong? Well, that's, that's what my mother and father always wanted because on the one hand they produced this amazing woman that achieved so much and, and devoted her whole life to other people and then they went, what happened? <laughs> and, and I always blame Macquarie University for that because there were three universities in Sydney at the time. There was Sydney University, which was the most prestigious. Yeah. Uh, there was New South Wales University, which was almost as pre prestigious, and then there was Macquarie University, which was um, alternative. Uh, we'll go with that. <laughs> um, one thing that has impressed me in Peter's family is his dad, Terry, who was such a prominent artist for pulp magazine covers, and occasionally Peter has posted some of these uh, on the Facebook and other places for, for us to enjoy. Uh, Terry passed away about six years ago, but I wish we had a way of projecting some of Terry's great art, and some of you, you might even recognize. Tell us a little bit about your dad's uh, career as an artist. Uh, well, this is gonna be a little bit tough to do because I tend to get emotional when I talk about him. Uh, we were very close. So forgive me if I get emotional about him because um, he was an amazing man. Um, he was born in 1927. He, uh, he was too young to um, go to World War, uh, World War II, um, but he went to uh, study art in uh, about 1945 or 46, I think it was. And his work impressed um, the teachers and um, he gained a scholarship to do a higher degree of art. And when we're talking um, artistry, I guess you'd call it, um, pen and ink sketching, um, painting, drawing, designing. Um, and he then obtained a job uh, as an illustrator for pulp magazines which were very, very big in the 50s uh, after World War II. Uh, it was a major industry in Australia and I believe here as well. Um, and he was employed to uh, draw cover art for pulp magazines and also illustrate action scenes within the magazine. So uh, his, he made a career uh, of art. So he was a professional artist for uh, a good 60 years, so yeah. he, and he made a good living out of it. Um, he could do any sort of art, but he preferred the meticulous, detailed art that I have posted occasionally on Facebook. I don't post very much of it, um, uh, just because I, I don't think people are that interested, but I'm proud of a lot of his work, so I, I uh, post maybe two things a year. You, you may have seen the Western art in particular, yeah. um, but he also did detective uh, pulp fiction. Um, and to my surprise, I learned uh, last year, a man contacted me out of the blue and uh, asked me um, if my father was uh, Terry Brand. And I, I said, yeah, why are you asking? And he said, because he had a big back catalogue of science fiction. And he, I, that was brand new to me, and it was all done in the 50s, um, you know, before I was born. And he mustn't have been very proud of it because he ditched a lot of it. And I, I didn't see it until this gentleman contacted me 
and had his back catalogue of all his um, science fiction art. And I've got to tell you, I can understand why he threw it out because um, it was very, very 50s, very garish, very colourful, uh, space rockets and um, women in bikinis, um, in space suits. Um, it seemed ob obligatory back then that the woman, the, the man could wear a full body space suit and have a space gun, but the, his female companion had to be in a bikini within the space suit, um, which was transparent. So um, I can understand why he threw all that out and probably didn't consider it good art, but um, he did show me in the 60s, he then was pretty proud of the Western art and the detective art because it was all action um, and it was more realistic. He was working from um, photo stills from Western movies and, um, and all that film noir that was very popular after World War II. Well, we're going to get into your interest in uh, Wild West history a little later on, but did Terry's work in art influence you to love the Wild West? And yeah, very much so, because I could, I could see that there was a lot of interest in what he was drawing. He was making a living out of it, and some of the cover art for the Westerns in particular were great, because that would be a colour illustration, and it would be normally a stagecoach out of control, or being held up, or a gunfight, mm -hmm. or uh, uh, you know, a maverick horse, or a bucking bronco, or something like that. And, and I was watching him draw that in the 60s um, as a very, very young child, but I, I could appreciate the detail, and I could see the hours that he used to put into that work. He could work from home, obviously, because he had a home art studio, and uh, so I could. I was privileged enough to get to watch him work, and um, and it was a very different upbringing because when I'd go to school, most of my friends, their fathers had other types of jobs. You, you normal, what I call a normal type of job, where you know they work in an office or they drive a truck or you know all good jobs, but. Um, I did not experience that with my father. I was, I was kind of able to be at work with him at home. I was watching him work and watching him illustrate, watching the time and effort that he put into producing these very fine art detail um, that he loved to do. So yeah. if anyone, I hope everyone can understand my accent, by the way. Um, I know a lot of people ask me to m repeat myself occasionally. So. But anyway, um, his passion was fine art, not, not the broad brush stroke that most of you are familiar with Bob Bowes Bell from True West. Uh, he, he paints with a very broad brush stroke to get that atmospheric look about his paintings and they're brilliant, I love them. Um, you know, he can create smoke and, and gun smoke and give, give the, his painting a real atmospheric tone, whereas my father's work was more accurate in terms of, mm. if he sat down to sketch you, mm -hmm. you would get a perfect representation of you. It wouldn't be an interpretation as Bob yeah. Bell might do. No. It would be a pen and ink sketch and it would take hours, literally. Did you inherit any of his art ability? So early on I tried desperately to uh, emulate him and he, he to his credit, he tried to give me lessons and uh, it became obvious to both of us that that wasn't going to happen. Uh, yeah, my dad was quite a great fiddle player and uh, tried to get me to play the fiddle, but uh, fiddling around was about all I did. <clears throat> we won't go there. Yeah, so in, in, in sh the short answer to your question was yes, he, that did pique my interest greatly in, uh, in the Wild West and in the 60s as well growing up, as probably everybody knows, the, the main television uh, shows at that time were all westerns, or the, the major ones were westerns. So that also influenced me. I could yeah. see his work as still art, but then I could see the moving pictures on the TV and that just captivated me as well. Uh, I don't want to skip over the fact that your mom is still living. Just say a few words about mom. Boy, is she still living. She is a handful. I tell you what, she's 96 years of age and uh, she is still living in the family home that she's lived in for 70 years. She lives by herself 
and it's a big home, um, but we're determined, between my sister and myself, we're determined to uh, allow her to live in that home as long as, uh, as, long as she's able. And um, she is, uh, luckily for us, uh, she has all her faculties. Ah. Uh, very keen, um, in fact too keen. She follows current affairs, politics, American politics, Australian politics. Um, she's up to date on everything, listens to the news in the morning, watches the news on TV at night, reads um, newspapers, play, plays bridge, which is a complex game to play. Um, she plays Scrabble, um, again, you know, using the mind all the time. And um, she, in a lot of ways, she's a lot smarter and quicker on the uptake than I am. Well, you're very blessed to have a mom at 96 who is, has all her faculties and you can still enjoy uh, being with her. Um, I have to ask a little bit about Leslie. Leslie is the other half of Peter and I have this note here from someone who knows. She is beautiful, spicy, and funny, and tries to keep Peter in line. Well, the, the first few things you said are correct, um, but she's given up trying to keep me in line. Um, she originally, um, she was, I'm pretty sure if I hadn't have met her, I wouldn't have traveled to the United States when I did. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, she was the driving force that, that said to me, uh, well, if you love it that much, why don't you go over and check it out? So I, I said, well, I've never really had anyone to go with. And she said, I'll come. Uh -huh. So uh, in 1991, she did. And, um, and that was... Uh, that was a great trip. It was a, I dragged her everywhere that was, that we could get to that was uh, of importance in Wild West history. So we went to Virginia City, we went to Tombstone, we, we went uh, into New Mexico, we, we, we did a whole lot of things and uh, it, it was an amazing trip and she got me kick-started in, in the, the travel aspect of it. Wonderful. Well, we all are thankful for Leslie. Um, you've been researching the Earp tombstone topic for over 30 years. Particular interest in uncovering the lives of the men who rode with Wyatt Earp on the Vendetta Posse ride after the attempted assassination and the killing of Morgan Earp by Frank Stilwell. I had to throw that in. At, this, at the point that you're uh, growing up with your dad doing all of the artwork and becoming aware of uh, the American West, Wild West, and outlaws and lawmen, was Wyatt Earp your first interest or were there other aspects of the Wild West that you began with? Um, well, I was still an avid watcher of Westerns, so uh, I, there were a couple of Westerns that stood out to me that really piqued my interest. Um, Outlaw Josie Wales, I thought it was a, a brilliant movie and I still rank it right up there as one of the best westerns, even though it's kind of more Civil War um, era. Mm -hmm. uh, I love that western. And another western called The Long Riders, um, which was about the James Younger gang, mm -hmm. um, and that was a unique movie because the brothers were actually played by real life brothers, so you had the Carradine brothers uh, playing the youngers, and you had yeah. James and Stacy Keach playing um, Jesse and Frank James, and um, you had uh, there was a couple other sets of brothers there. Who did I say played the youngers? Did I say? Oh, sorry, um, the Carradine brothers. Yeah, played yeah. the youngers. Yeah. So that kind of emotional attachment within the movie, I thought, worked really well. So I. I I didn't get started straight into uh, Tombstone, no, I was enjoying these other westerns which were 1970s and then in the 1980s. Um, and then one night I, I came home after a big night out and uh, I, I came home and turned the television on and I just happened, just by fate, the movie Hour of the Gun was just starting up on the channel, I flicked onto 
and that has a very dramatic start because it starts at the walk down to the OK Corral and it has very great music behind it, very dramatic music. And um, even though I'd had a few drinks, I, it just grabbed my attention. I, I, I was riveted for that opening scene. It's a um, very dramatic start to any movie. And uh, that, that was the movie that got me hooked on the Tombstone story because it actually portrays, it starts at the gunfight and then shows you the vendetta ride and it shows you uh, Wyatt recruiting his vendetta posse and going out on the manhunt for the men that he feels are responsible for the, the maiming of Virgil and the killing of Morgan. And it's also a, a good movie because it, it doesn't show those events happening on the same night like a lot of uh, later movies do. So yeah. it, it also uh, shows the court uh, situation where they were uh, held accountable for their actions and, uh, and no other really, no other movies really bothered to show that either. So anyway, that was the, the hour of the gun was the movie and James Garner played Wyatt Earp. Yeah. Um, Jason Robards played a uh, very elderly Doc Holliday. He was probably way too old for the role, but he played an interesting take on Doc Holliday. But the James Garner portrayal of Wyatt Earp, I thought was um, very, very close to what I imagined mm -hmm. Wyatt would be. And the fact that he, it showed him recruiting the Vendetta writers um, was the first I'd even heard of that. Oh, and yeah. so that, that grabbed my interest and I, I decided that this is what I want to really dig into and, and get to the bottom of if I can. And, and we're glad you did. Uh, uh, some of us are generalists and write on a lot of topics and you've written on a lot of fellas and, uh, in regard to this and Doc Holliday has been a, a major character uh, in your writing. Um, Peter has had articles published in the NOLA Quarterly, WOLA Journal, Wild West, True West, Tombstone Epitaph, and of course we regularly publish his articles in the uh, WWHA Journal. Uh, his most recent, of course, was uh, The Sordid Lives and Lies of a Certain Young Lady by the Name of Sadie, uh, Wyatt Earp's wife, uh, Sarah Josephine Earp. Uh, or uh, what, Marcus Earp. So just while you're on that, could I ask everyone to do me a favor, could, could you raise your hand if you've read that article of Josie O'Belly? Okay, so quite a few. Great, great. Yes. And uh, even though I'm leaving the editor's chair pretty soon, I've got a great article just waiting to, to be published on another a young lady uh, from Tombstone and uh, Arizona, and I won't tell you who it is yet, but there's more to come from Peter on uh, some of the young ladies of, uh, of that era. We've, uh, we've honored uh, Peter several times with awards. In 2011, he was awarded uh, the Journal Article of the Year for Duty Bound, the story of John Wilson Vermillion, and the mystery of Tombstone's Texas Jack. We didn't know for years that we had the wrong Texas Jack. And Peter was suspicious and began to dig into, have we got the right guy? And what did you find out? Well, before we get into that, the one thing that I have to make clear is that um, in 1991, if we just flash back a minute to the, the first visit, I was very, very fortunate um, to meet two people in Tombstone that changed my, okay. my career, if you like, my, in, my interest career anyway. And that, those two people were Chuck and Gene Smith. Ah. And they're, uh, uh, Gene's in the room, I, I don't know. I don't know if Chuck's here. Um, but I happened to meet them in the Crystal Palace in Tombstone just by accident with Leslie and, um, they were able to explain what was going on because I was there on a special weekend. I didn't know I was, but I was. And everyone was dressed in period costume except, except ourselves. So uh, I, I asked the, um, what was going on and Chuck and Gene were very uh, happy to help me understand the situation. 
and we formed a, a, a great friendship out of that meeting and then subsequent meetings uh, when we'd revisit Tombstone. And so we became very close friends and um, they both helped me understand how to research uh, in family records, genealogy, um, and they sort of, they taught me how to trace family histories because I'd never done that before. Um, they were also very supportive in terms of um, accommodation, very generous, allowing me to stay at their, their house there in Safford. Um, and so I owe a lot of um, that early um, education and friendships to um, Chuck and Jean Smith. And, and just on that, Jean is now the treasurer of this great organisation. So in lots of ways, we've both sort of come up um, and you know, here we are. Well, I had a little conversation with Jean before we got here because we weren't sure where you were. And I thought maybe you'd gone to take a nap and you didn't answer a text. And I finally said, Gene, if we don't get Peter in here, I'm going to interview you. <laughs> she got well, around and got you down here. <laughs> yeah, well, I was just resting in the room and uh, I got a phone call and I thought, this is odd. Um, and I answered the phone. It was Gene and she, Gene always plays her cards very close to her chest and she just said are you okay um you, you know what are you doing and i said oh, i'm just having a rest and she said will you be down later and i said yeah i'll be down later and i thought that was um that was nice that she was showing interest in where i was and she said because i need to talk to you but she didn't say that you needed to talk to me uh -huh. and she certainly didn't say that i'd be up here talking to everybody or you might not have come. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm still shocked that I'm here doing it. Uh, um, I do have some things to uh, ask you about your, your work with uh, Jean and uh, others that you've written with. Um, I did mention the uh, John Wilson Vermillion, and then there's uh, the uh, 2017 that you won the best article of the year for The Killing of Charlie Storms by Luke Short in 2021 that groundbreaking work that you did on Ben Sippy, which we really knew almost nothing about Ben Sippy uh, until you uh, dug into that for us, which was a great two-part series. And then, as I mentioned, uh, your latest article on uh, Sadie Earp. But along the way, as you met Gene and Chuck and Tombstone and developed this relationship, I hear you giving credit to them for helping you learn the process of research. Yeah, because I'd never, um, the job that I'd had involved investigating um, accounting error or complaints about accounting. So I was keen to do investigation. That, that's what I'd done for a living. Not this type of investigation, but investigation all the same. Mm -hmm. um, but I'd never thought that I'd, I'd never experienced the, in, the investigative skills or um, methodology that comes with doing writing or, or writing his history. So, you know, I needed somebody to show me the way there. And it just, as I said, I just got very, very lucky to meet two extremely knowledgeable people who were Arizonans to start with, lived near Tombstone, visited Tombstone often, knew who was who in Tombstone yeah. um, and they had lots of friends there as well and they also knew how to research so you know I owe them a lot. So you didn't go to the Crystal Palace looking for someone to become your mentor? No we, we heard like I knew Crystal Palace was the place to be at back in 1991 and we went in there they had a band playing and in fact the second year I went Chuck was, Chuck was actually in the band um, and we both yeah. love live music, so um, it was a natural fit, and we both liked to drink. Um, uh, so it was a perfect mix, really. Um, but along the way, I, I picked up um, these skills that I, I, I knew that I would need if I wanted to be serious about the situation. Um, so, yeah, very, very fortunate. And I don't forget that. And over the years, you've not only come to America, but I believe they went to Australia to visit you. 
Yeah, so um, I think it was the year 2000, Jean, is that right? Yeah, so Jean and Chuck visited and we took them to um, some sites along the harbour, had, had some great lunches um, with great views of the Sydney Harbour, which is pretty spectacular. And uh, so that was great. I was glad that they were able to come out and see the city that I, I lived in um, because I was so keen to get back and, um, and visit, revisit them as well. Well, is it true that not only did you come to America to study our Wild West, but they went to Australia to study Quigley? I have not heard that. <laughs> it wasn't Quigley down under that took you to Australia. <laughs> I had to throw I, that. I know, I know a lot of people think that that movie is a great movie. I, I, do, I do know that. I, yes, it gets yes. me. Well, it was on the cover of True West, so it must it be popular. To. It has to be. <laughs> um, well, let's talk about some of the accomplishments, and I wanted to start with John Wilson Vermillion because we just had the wrong Texas Jack for years and years. How much, how much time have we got? Oh, Because that, just... that story is a long story. Uh, just uh, give us the highlights of uh, how it was that we now know who the real Texas Jack was. Well, it, it, it was very difficult because every book I picked up um, around from Casey Teftel's book through Glenn Boyer's books through Ben Trawick's books, everybody was saying that uh, a gentleman by the name of John Wilson Vermillion was Texas Jack Vermillion and that they had gained that information from a uh, Doc Holliday uh, biography that was written in the 50s by a lady named Pat Yarns. And she, had, she was the one that identified him originally as Texas Jack. And all subsequent authors had followed her lead. The trouble was that she had no footnotes uh, to explain how she came to the conclusion. And every other author, major author, had followed her lead without actually um, I hate to say it, but they hadn't done their homework. They just accepted what had been written in the 50s by Pat Yarns, and they reprinted it. Casey Teftilla uh, went to the trouble of actually contacting the family, and he printed a photo of Texas Jack, that you, the one that is most popular on the internet. It, it's a Civil War. He was a Civil War Confederate cavalry uh, out of Tennessee. And he, uh, he's pictured holding a small pistol and a sabre. Uh, and it's a very striking image. And it, it, everyone loved to look at it and say, well, that's Texas Jack. That's got to be the guy because everyone's yeah. saying it's the guy. Now we have a photo from his family. Uh, so, uh, you know, I was accepting of the fact too. I thought, well, they must be right. Everybody's saying it. It must be right. They got the photo. Um, but his name was John Wilson Vermillion, so it was J.W. Vermillion. Yet when Jean started to dig into the genealogy record around Tombstone, we had the, the voter registry, we had the census, um, and we also had uh, a list of deputies that Virgil Earp uh, deputised after the great fire in 1881 to protect the town from looters. Every single primary source was listing him as John O. Vermillion. Yes. O. Yes. And that immediately thought, sent alarm bells off with me. And I said to Gene, well, what's happening here? He, well, did, he, did, he, did they get the middle initial wrong every time he did, registered for something? Yeah. Obviously not. Um, and then it, that drove me back into what Wyatt Earp had said about him. And Earp, uh, in a letter to Walter Noble Burns, I think um, Earp said that he was a carpenter by trade. And when we looked in the 1880 census, there he was in Silver City, New Mexico, listed as J.W. Vermillion, a carpenter from Virginia. So what we were finding wasn't adding up with what Casey and Glenn Boyer and Ben Trawick and Pat Yarns had written. So big red flags were flying everywhere and that, that's where the genealogy research really came into the fore because it, it was starting to prove that there was another man involved here and his middle initial was O, it wasn't W, so he couldn't have been John Wilson Vermillion. That was the assumption that we made and we went, we, 
we went and ran with that idea. So we started then to try and hunt down who this John Overmillion was. And I believe you actually met his grandson or great grandson, Douglas Vermillion? Um, well, no, well, no, that's another story. So I, I was pretty keen at the time to visit with John Wilson Vermillion's family just to make sure that, that like, how did the story start? So I flew to, uh, I flew to Ohio, I rented a car, drove down uh, into Tennessee and met with the, uh, the, the grandson of, of uh, John Wilson Vermillion. And he was a very elderly man, but he, he was shocked to find an Australian um, interested and he, he was more shocked than, than anything um, to have an Australian in his living room. And he was very generous, he took me in and, um, and I interviewed him and he knew nothing about Texas Jack Vermillion. Okay. All he knew was that some reporters had contacted his mother in the 1950s, and I assumed that that was Pat Jones. And uh, they had asked if uh, they had a, uh, if their, uh, if his grandfather was John Wilson Vermeen. Had John Wilson Vermeen been in the West? Had he been a lawman? They answered yes, yes. And so he suddenly became Texas Jack. The fact was that um, eventually we, we determined that um, John Wilson Vermeen had been a lawman in the West. He'd been, in fact, the city marshal in Webb City, Missouri. Uh, so he was an accomplished lawman. Um, he, he did the job uh, during a very difficult time in Webb City, Missouri's history. Uh, he was a brave, dutiful man, um, which is why I named the article Duty Bound. Uh, but he had never, ever been to Arizona. He had oh. never, ever set foot uh, on Arizona soil and we knew or I knew straight away that everything in, that had been written about him had been wrong. So then the next step was then to contact the family of the John Overmillion and that's where Douglas Vermillion um, okay. came into play. So he, uh, he got on board through the website that Gene and I had running uh, with just basic information about all the Vendetta writers, but being a Vermillion himself, a distant relation to all the Vermillions are related apparently, because they all descended from a French Vermillion that came out here. But anyway, this Douglas Vermillion got on board with the, with the project and was very helpful in uh, making contact with um, John Overmillion's family, as well as John Wilson Vermillion's family. So he was able to be the the link. Being of a million, they were much more open to him contacting them than a strange Australian guy with long hair who really, you know, they couldn't understand. You have worked extensively on the uh, Vendetta Posse, as we called it. Um, sometimes I call it something else because, well, that's another story. When you're related to someone that Wyatt killed, you have a little different uh, uh, take on some things, as Pam will tell you. But you've uncovered new information on Dan Tipton, uh, Turkey Creek, Jack Johnson, uh, O.C. Smith, or Charlie Smith, and you just kept on working on the Vendetta Posse in, uh, in a depth that no one else has. Yeah, well, the... The fact was that after that first trip, I, I bought. A, I had to buy a, a new bag in America to transport all the books that I bought home. And when I got home, I was so anxious to read everything that had been written. I, I bought um, Ben Trawick's books. I bought Michael Hickey's books. I bought Paula Mitchell Mark's book. Uh, I bought everything I could possibly read. I, I read them all, and I was at the end of the day, I was disappointed because. No one had written about the Vendetta writers. I mean, we knew they'd written about Doc and they wrote about um, Wyatt, but no one had, it was always Doc and Wyatt and the other guys. And I was more interested in the other guys because I'd read all about Doc and Wyatt and I wanted to learn 
the background and the reasons and the type of guys that would put their hand up in that situation to ride with Doc and Wyatt. And no one had really explained that to me in their, in their publication. So it was clear to me that um, Gene and I and Chuck were going to have to do our own work if we were going to find that out because nobody else had done it. Right. So that's how I got started on that whole project. I, I was really out of in, my own interest to learn who they were because I, I mentioned this to a couple of people the other day who asked me, you know, what, what was going on. I said, I wanted to know um, when Virgil Earp was hit with shotgun fire from ambush, um, Wyatt Earp um, sent a telegram off to Crowley Dake, the, the US Marshal for the Territory, asking him to be um, appointed as a, a Deputy US Marshal, but with the power to deputise men to go after these, these guys that had shotgun Virgil. And I wanted to know what type of guy would put his hand up at that stage, having just seen Virgil shotgun from ambush uh, in the dead of night, I wanted to know what type of guy would then suddenly volunteer to put themselves in the line of that kind of fire. Because it was clear at that stage that the Cowboys meant business in terms of revenge. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wanted to delve into the types of people that would say, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. I'll put my life on the line for the Earp family uh, and Doc Holliday to some extent because I guess he was on the murder list as well. Yes. Um, now your latest, your latest book, I believe, is Doc Holliday's Nemesis, the story of Johnny Tyler and Tombstone's Gambler's War. That was another rather murky story as to who Johnny Tyler uh, even was, but you've been digging into Doc Holliday's life uh, uh, pretty deeply. Tell us a little bit about your interest there. So what I did with uh, the Vendetta writers, I ended up writing biographical articles uh, for, or how, how do you say it, Mike? Article? Article. Um, yeah, article. He's always in, imitating me. Um, so I, I published uh, Sherman McMaster biography in Walla, mm -hmm. uh, Dan Tipton in Nola, mm -hmm. uh, a bit on Curly Bill in Walla, uh, Turkey Creek, uh, Jack Johnson, and uh, Dan Tipton uh, in Nola. Um, and Charlie Smith is yet to be published, but it's been written. So. It was clear to me that I'd covered those bases, and at that time I'd, I'd sort of found everything I thought I could find. So I wrote the book on who, who the real Texas Jack was, mm -hmm. and if anyone is interested, you get two biographies for the price of one with that, because I had to tell the life story of John Oberland Vermeer, yeah. who was really the Texas Jack of Tombstone fame. But in order to convince everybody that I had the right story, I then had to write the biography of John Wilson Vermillion and add that into the same book as the second part of the book. So you get two biographies for the price of one with That's that book. Right. Um, having completed that book, um, the next step I thought would be to write um, a book about the vendetta itself. Um, but I realised that, that that was going to be a difficult task. Um, a very difficult task to try to work out how to combine the biographies of the guys uh, into a book that would flow properly because all these guys, the Vendetta writers, came from different backgrounds. Um, they all had different skills. They all came from different family backgrounds and different parts of the United States. And I'm still to this day trying to work out how I'm going to present that in a book form. So I got interested then in um, other aspects of Tombstone. So I wrote the article you mentioned about um, when Luke Short killed Charlie Storms uh, at the front of the Oriental Saloon in, in Tombstone. A lot of people just thought that was a one-off argument between two gamblers and uh, it resulted in a shootout there on uh, Allen Street. Uh, Luke Short was faster on the draw, literally, um, than Charlie Storms and killed him there. And a lot of people were writing that that was just a one-off uh, incident between two uh, gamblers who'd had an argument. But 
the, the more I dug into it and the more I spoke with Roger J, who unfortunately is no longer with us, um, the more it, it turned out that there was a lot more to that story. It was, a, it was the culmination or part of the culmination of a, a gambler's war in, in Tombstone. So just like any turf war that you'd see today between gangs, the same animosities existed between rival gamblers who were all trying to um, get the fairer dollar. The, the main uh, source of their income was playing pharaoh. And to open a pharaoh table in Tombstone um, was a difficult thing because you need a big bankroll, uh, a lot of money, and uh, you had to be better than the opposition. So there, there was a, a war of sorts going on, not, not, not open warfare, but there was a lot of um, uh, difficulties created in the Oriental Saloon. There was difficulties created in the Alhambra Saloon, uh, in Vogan's Alley Saloon and Bar. Uh, and so I got very interested in that and I happened to get lucky and I I found Luke Short's testimony, the coronial testimony that Luke Short gave. Uh, no one had found that before and I just got very lucky. It was picked up. The nugget apparently reported the entire coronial inquest, but the nugget is missing for that vital period. And I got very lucky and found Luke Short's testimony in another newspaper up in uh, the Dakota territories that had picked up the uh, the Nugget Report and reported Luke Short's word-for-word -word testimony. When you read Luke Short's testimony, it was clear that there was something, uh, something more to the story. So that led me into researching the Gambler's War, uh, and that led me to Johnny Tyler, who was a vicious, uh, very vicious, quick to violence character, unlike the, the cowardly uh, character that was portrayed in the movie Tombstone. Uh, where the famous scene where Wyatt Earp slaps him and Wyatt's unarmed and he, he uh, challenges Tyler to skin the smoke wagon and see what happens and are you going to just stand there and bleed? Uh, that famous scene has been repeated to me over and over on the internet, uh, much to my dismay because I know that Tyler was nothing like he was portrayed in the movie. So I thought um, I'm going to go a bit left of field here and I'm going to write the... Uh, the biography of Johnny Tyler. And uh, so that took me up into Nevada and California and uh, Cal Colorado to do research on him. And then in turn that led me to more information about Doc Holliday. So it was a circuitous route, but it, it really, uh, when I got to the Leadville chapter on Johnny Tyler, Doc Holliday uh, comes into the story more. He's in the story in Tombstone as well. Uh, but the thing is, uh, Wyatt Earp actually did throw Johnny Tyler out of Tombstone, uh, but it wasn't as portrayed in the movie. It was Tyler who actually pulled the smoke wagon in Lou Rickabar's gaming room. So it was Tyler who initiated the action with, by pulling the smoke wagon. It was Wyatt Earp who reacted very quickly and disarmed him, uh, belted him, or punched him, as you would say, and uh, threw him down the stairs of Lou Rickabar's gaming room out onto Allen Street and warned Tyler to leave Tombstone and do not come back. And uh, Tyler uh, was smart enough to take the advice and he left. So he did, he did interact uh, with uh, Doc Holliday during that brief period in the Tombstone chapter, but when I got to Leadville, Tyler comes into his own up there in Leadville and so to some extent does Doc. And I got really captured uh, by the Doc Holiday that I found in Leadville as opposed to the Doc Holiday that was in Tombstone. They, they were almost two different men to some extent and I, uh, I, the Leadville chapter really comes alive because of Doc Holiday. Uh, he, he and Tyler were adversaries again, this is in 18 between 1882 and 1885 in Leadville. So that book, uh, I've been told by a couple of people that that book comes alive once Doc appears again, as most movies come alive when Doc appears in them. So does my book to some extent because they clash again. Tyler and Doc clash again in Leadville. 
Well, part of the emphasis I wanted to make tonight is Peter's work on characters that had been underserved. Uh, their stories needed to be told, and we haven't even talked about uh, Sherman McMasters and Perry Malin and uh, on and on we could go. But I wanted to say a little bit about some of the people you've worked with. You've talked about the benefit that Gene and Chuck have been to you, and they've been a great benefit to uh, a number of us. And uh, I'm thinking of Paul Cool, and I'm thinking of Mark Dorkin, and I'm thinking of Lee Silva, and so Roger J, who have all gone on. Yeah, I'm going to get emotional again. And you've worked closely with those men, and I thought you might just take a minute to say a little bit about the enjoyment that you had of working with those really good historians. Yeah, well, one of the, one of the really great things that I've experienced by doing this is meeting so many fantastic people. And when I go home to Australia, um, a lot of Australians who haven't travelled to America, the first thing they ask me is, how did, how did you get on in America? Because often all we see is bad news in Australia. Yeah. Um, the good news doesn't get reported, but the bad news does. Uh, so they, the first thing they say is, you know, how, how did you deal with Americans? And I said, I've never met any better people. Good. Um, and, I, and that's an honest statement from the heart. I've, I've met so many fantastic people. The tragedy is that so many of them uh, that I've worked with and become friendly with have passed on um, way too young. And the first one of those was Paul Cool. Uh, and I'm not sure who here would know who Paul Cool was, uh, but he was a very, very diligent researcher. Um, he was very well educated. Um, and he was uh, the guy that really um, befriended me when I first came over in 2000 to attend a Waller conference. Uh, he was, he had no ego to him. He was, he was very welcoming and he was very happy to share whatever he'd found on the characters that I was interested in. Because as we all know, when you research one character, you might run into another that someone else is interested in. And rather than keeping that information to himself, he would generously uh, pass it on. And that, I thought that was wonderful. I thought that was a rare thing too, because often there's jealousies involved and people don't want other people to succeed and they'll hoard information or keep it, keep it quiet. But Paul was not like that. Um, and unfortunately for all of us, he uh, passed away uh, in I think 2016 or 15 or 16 um, and we held a bit of a memorial service for him at a Tombstone Territory rendezvous there uh, in remembrance of him and his wife came to that event which was very touching. Um, another, another guy that was very influential to me was uh, Roger Jay who was a very intelligent, very articulate, uh, fantastic writer uh, and if you've bought the Wyatt Earp Anthology book that uh, Roy and Casey and Gary uh, edited, which has, I, I can't remember how many articles it has, but it has like 60 articles or something. <laughs> well, five of those articles, uh, at least five, I think, uh, Roger J, yes. uh, Roger J's work. So uh, Roger also taught me a lot about how to tell, uh, what, what Roger taught me was how to tell not the entire story, but an episode of the entire story. So he was very, very good at um, writing an article about a specific moment in the character's life that was pivotal. So he wrote about Wyatt in Wichita, he wrote about Wyatt in Kansas City, he wrote about Wyatt in Peoria, uh, he wrote about Doc Holliday in Leadville. Um, and so he taught me that you didn't have to tell the entire story in one hit, you could, you could take a, uh, a portion of the story and really whet everybody's appetite for the next installment. So uh, he, was, he was instrumental in trying to teach me that. And unfortunately, again, he's, he's passed away. And so many of our good friends, and your friends were my friends, uh, we don't have time really to tell the story of the great work of Mark Dworkin and Lee Silva, but 
We've had some really good friends, historians who have passed, and uh, we, we mourn their passing. What I want to do before we uh, wrap this up here in just a little bit are, are two things. I want to ask you what's next for Peter Brand, and then we're going to open it up to the audience to ask a few questions. And uh, Yeah, sure. I, I just wanted to add about two of those guys we just brushed okay. over. Okay. Mark, Mark Dworkin was a, another um, great researcher, very friendly guy, and he actually helped uh, with, with the aid of Gene Smith, uh, he helped to get Dan Tipton's grave, which yeah. was unmarked. He helped very much uh, to get that grave marked because Dan Tipton rode with Wyatt Earp in the Vendetta and he was also a, uh, a veteran of the Civil War and he was a sailor, uh, of all things, out of New York uh, during the Civil War. So we were able to get the VA to uh, put a veteran's marker on Tipton's grave, and that was in large part to Mark Dworkin. Uh, yes. And Mark is no longer with us. And also Lee Silver, whose uh, life's work never got published, unfortunately, because he passed away. Um, but he has two huge volumes that were published that uh, I would urge anybody interested in Tombstone to, or Wyatt to try and get hold of those books. They're, they're expensive, but they're worth the purchase. And again, he passed away, and he was another very, very generous man that influenced me a lot. Uh, opened his house up to me uh, on many occasions and just would invite you around just to talk what he called herb. He, he would use uh, it as a verb, and we'd, we'd herb. And we may yet see his third volume. Uh, well, I hope so, yeah. Uh, David Haas uh, has that uh, collection. And I think one of these days we're going to see volume three, which is the Earps in Tombstone. I, I certainly hope so, because Lee Silver was a, a unique character. You, uh, I think uh, someone should write his biography, because he did just about everything from playing music in Las Vegas to being a, a beach bum on Long Beach to... Deep sea diving. Deep sea diving, antique collecting, gun collecting, book collecting, writing, acting. researching, acting. Yeah, yeah, incredible man. Tell us in just a, a few words, uh, what's next for Peter Brand? Well, I'll go back to where I started. I'm still... I know, and I know I've spoken to a couple of people in this room about exactly how to tell the story of the Vendetta ride because it's been told already in several books but what the thought that I've been trying to come to grips with was how to tell it my way my way sorry um, and um, so I'm still I'm working out a way to uh, tell the story of those writers maybe a chapter on where they came each a chapter on each of those vendetta writers uh, backgrounds mm -hmm. Uh, have them all arrive in Tombstone at various times, tell the story of what happened in Tombstone, tell the vendetta, but then more importantly, uh, explain what happened to each and every one of those men after the vendetta, because they all had, they all had lives before Tombstone and, bef and after Tombstone, and I, from what I already have, uh, they're incredible lives. They're, they're Wild West lives that they deserve uh, as, just as much um, airtime as, as you know, the main players. I call them, when I talk about the main players, I'm talking about the famous men like Bat Masterson, Doc Holliday, well, the Earth Brothers, Johnny Bean. Everybody who's a, more or less a household name has had their story told. But right. my, my theory, and I've, I've told several people this, my theory through the whole process has been if I want to know more about Roy Young, for example, I, I will try to research the people around Roy Young, for one of another example. Yeah. Um, and I'll try to see who your friends are, mm -hmm. uh, and then I'll try and look at who your enemies are, mm -hmm. and then I'll research those friends and enemies. And that's what I've tried to do with Doc Holliday and Wyatt Earp, to try and give us a better understanding of who those two more, or the Earp brothers as well, who those more famous men actually were by who they associated with and who they would not associate with. And I've learned an awful lot about Doc and Wyatt uh, by doing that and I can tell you in advance that both Doc and Wyatt come out looking a lot better than the enemies that I have researched. 
and, um, and they have come to a, a better understanding of why their friends supported them. Yeah. Uh, and that's evident in the Perry Mallon booklet that I wrote about the guy who arrested Doc in Denver. Um, once you understand uh, who Perry Mallon was, Doc Holliday comes off looking like the, the noble, brave guy that he probably was, fighting disease and trying to live, a, live his life as best he could. And he was constantly being harassed by uh, several people who didn't like him for various reasons. But Perry Mallon made him a, a famous national identity in 1882 when he arrested him in Denver. And again, that piqued my interest and I wanted to know who this guy was that could pull off an arrest that nobody else could pull off. But when I wrote his biography, which is also available, uh, he turns out to be an absolute, I won't use the word I would use if I'd had a few drinks, but he, he turns out to be a vicious, evil kind of guy. And Doc looks a lot, Doc's up here compared to him. Well, I say this with great hesitation and reticence, but I have a couple of the Perry Malin books for sale back on the back table. Well, I'm happy to sign them. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I hope you've enjoyed this. I have, but I want to hear what you would like to know uh, from Peter. And if you have a question and we'll raise your hand and speak loudly, we'll, uh, we'll go from there. Jeffrey. How difficult is it to do research from Australia? In the early days, it was virtually impossible. Um, I would have to come over, physically fly over, rent a car, uh, rendezvous with Chuck and Jean, uh, discuss you know, what we should be looking for and then I'd go off normally on a three week trip and, and do the physical research myself. Since the advent of the internet um, and more, as more and more records are online, it has become a little bit easier to search primary resource like newspapers, some archives uh, have, have digitized their information. So it's become easier over time, uh, but I still like to come and do the research myself. Uh, but uh, as more information is available on the internet, uh, it, has, it has certainly become easier than when I started. But in saying that, um, there's been a certain, um, amount of trouble uh, accessing some records because some institutions in America uh, have shut their firewalls to foreign uh, internet access. So uh, Utah, for whatever reason, uh, Randy Lish, is he in the room? Is Randy there? Yeah, you're from Utah, right? Well, why do you hate Australians? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I, I had an occasion to try to research in, in the Utah State Archive and uh, for several years I was able to do it and then all of a sudden uh, they put a firewall up to exclude any foreign or any non-national from accessing their archive. So I had to call on uh, Mike Mihailovic, who is another up-and-coming um, researcher that you'll hear a lot more about in the future and he was able to help me access uh, very generously again and that goes back to what you were talking about um, I've met so many great people through this process Mike's um, an up and comer yeah but uh, and that feeds into a, the answer to your question you still need help you still need help on the ground here in America and, and I've made so many friends that are willing to help and not only willing to help but go out of their way to help and um, that's, that's a great thing Jeffrey, your question uh, makes me think of the great researchers who are not American citizens. Mark Dworkin wrote that great book on Walter Noble Burns. Uh, Fred Nolan from England wrote those great books on Billy the Kid. Uh, Joe Rosa, the great books on Wild Bill Hickok, and Peter on all the, uh, the great uh, stories about the Vendetta Riders. We're really blessed to have these guys from Canada and England and Australia uh, doing such fine work on the behalf and, of And uh, Mike, Mike Bell too from... Oh, Mike Bell. Bell yeah. uh, his, his Wild Bunch work is fantastic. 
Mike, I know you're watching and I'm sorry I left you out. Mike is one of the great researchers on uh, the Wild Bunch and uh, Butch and Sundance and uh, also lives in England. Okay, another question. No more questions. Mike? Oh, well, yeah, uh, so the Perry Mallon book was originally written back in 2006 and uh, my father was um, still, he was still active up until two weeks before he passed away in 2017, so he did a pen and ink sketch uh, for the cover of the Perry Mallon book and uh, I love it and I've got it framed at home. Uh, yeah, so thanks for that question. Yeah, his art is on that Perry Mellon book. And if you want to say it, I, I hesitate, or see it, I hesitate to say, but I do have two copies for sale. Uh, right there. Another question, yes, over here, uh, Mar uh, Madison. Uh, do you plan on publishing a book with any of your father's artwork? Uh, not at this stage, no. I, I, I think, um, I'm not sure who would buy that. Um, and that's a very personal thing for me now, now that he's passed. Um, I treasure it um, and I do, I do, as I said, make some of it available on Facebook occasionally, once or twice a year, uh, but there, no, I don't have any plans to uh, put it in a book form because I just don't think I'd be able to sell it and uh, that, would, that would hurt. <laughs> Well, he was an exceptional artist, and if you have a chance to see what Peter posts uh, on occasion of his dad's work, you'll be very impressed. Another question? We covered everything? Yes, Matt. Now, who are you asking? <laughs> you, you really want me to answer that? <laughs> well, at the risk of offending Roy, I hope I don't. Um, I, I think he had it coming, and I think he got he got it in. Uh, he he got what he had coming in, and just on that, um, uh, George Hand, who was a saloon keeper at the time, he witnessed the corpse and he was his comment was it was the worst shot up man I'd ever seen and when I read the the inquest into his his death uh, or his, his murder as Roy would say assassination uh, ass sorry assassination <laughs> um, I was struck by the number of wounds uh, in Frank Stillwell and it's very, very obvious to me that Wyatt Earp was not the only man who put bullets into Frank Stillwell. I'm of the opinion that every single member of that posse that was with him that day or that night pumped lead into Frank Stillwell. And I'm not sure if it was a sign of solidarity. It may well have been. Um, it sounds very brutal, but they were all seen chasing him uh, down the railroad track and that was witnessed by uh, a train driver who, who saw that in the, in the moonlight uh, and Frank Stillwell was shot to pieces not just by Wyatt Earp but yeah. by all those guys. And, and Matt, I don't soft soap it either. Uh, it was three years ago that I finally found the proof that Frank was the man who killed Morgan Earp uh, and I'm not going to try to gloss over uh, who he was, but I'm getting very close to finishing the Frank Stillwell biography, and I think it'll have some new things in there that uh, people will be interested in hearing about. Well, we've gone over our uh, hour, which was easy to do because Peter's an easy interview. Uh, well, well, just on that, I... <laughs> Mike Mabry has been very supportive too with his podcasts and I'd urge anybody um, here who hasn't um, listened to Mike Mabry's podcast to, to listen to them because it's so easy to go over time because he, he gets you talking and you've got me talking and, and I, I, I don't stop. You were easy to get talking. 
I have to say, I think this is the largest crowd we've ever had for an evening with. And that reflects on the joy that we have from men like Peter Brand and the others that we've interviewed over these uh, last 16 years. And Peter, we want to thank you for who you are, the work you do, and the work you're going to do. Thank you. Could I, could I just ask you one question before we finish up? Yes. Was I the only one that didn't know that it was going to be me? <laughs> or, or did all these people know in advance that it was going to be me? The only one that knew was Gene and myself, and we've been planning this for three years. Well, it, it, it's amazing to me, and I, I, I say this in all sincerity, I, it's a full room. Yes. And, and I haven't seen... I think I've seen one or two people walk out. I'll get to them later. Um, but it, it's amazing that everybody's still here. I'm, I'm shocked and I'm honoured. I'm honoured. Well, thank you for being Peter Brown and thank you for being our interview tonight. And let's give him a big hand. Thank you.